We have different kinds of telecommunication access solutions. For example, we have a fixed line internet and we have mobile phones. We have narrow band and broadband. And you have a choice now. What kind of technology of telecommunication technology are we talking about? Do you think the digital divide is closed and do you have access if you just have a mobile phone? Or no, do you need to have broadband, but do you need to have fixed or mobile broadband? So there is a different choice and we have to discuss of how to how to measure it. One alternative would be we just say, well, I don't care. We just, you have a choice. You can access the internet through a mobile or through a fixed solution. So let's add them all up. And we add them all up. So let's say all mobile phones in the world, all uh, fixed line internet connections. So you have to have access to the internet, but we don't care if it's fixed or mobile or, or broadband or narrow band. And let's see, let's have a first look at the digital divide. So this is the digital divide in the terms of the number of ICT subscriptions. And we can see here in the year 2001 that in the developed world, these are the richer, more industrialized, developed countries, we had on average 1.2 devices per person. And in the developing countries, you had less than one device per person. That means not everybody had a ICT, access to an ICT solution. We have 0 0.2 devices or subscription per person. So if we now make a ratio out of that, we can calculate the divide. 1.2 divided by 0 0.2 gives us a divide of 6 to 1. All right, and then five years later in 2006, let's look at this, the evolution of this divide. In the developed countries, the average of subscription increased to 1.5 devices per person. And in the developing countries, it increased even more, it more than doubled. It went up to 0 0.5 devices per person. That means that every second person, 50% of society already had access to an ICT solution. So we calculate the divide again, 1.5 divided by 3 gives a divide of 3 to 1. So the divide closed. It closed from 6 to 1 to 3 to 1. It's now smaller. And this is actually the most common way that people look at the digital divide. They just count the number of devices of subscriptions and then they say, well, here there are so many subscri subscribers, here there are so many subscribers and there's a divide. Well, obviously what we do not consider here now is that not all devices are equal. A mobile phone in a developed countries might most certainly not be the same as a mobile phone in developing countries. We know there's a qualitative difference. So we need to look at also that, at, at the bandwidth. And that is shown in this graph here. Let's see if you can read this graph. So first we have different bubbles, which are countries, and then we have two axes, the horizontal x-axis, which shows us the number of subscriptions per capita, per person. So here these people, they have, on average, there's one subscription per capita. That means on average, everybody has one ICT device. And here we have two subscriptions per capita. So that means on average, everybody has two devices. And here on the vertical y-axis, we have the capacity per subscription. That means the installed bandwidth potential measured in how many kilobits does each subscription on average communicate. And we see a two-part logic here. Seems like countries are migrating on these x-axis towards the right. And then they kind of like hit a wall here at two subscriptions per person. Well, you could say in general, once you have a fixed and a mobile solution, you don't need any more. You cannot handle much more, right? You have a cell phone and a laptop, and that's about it. Some people have, again, a standalone PC, and so it, on average, a little bit more. But on average, let's say if you have two solutions, that's, that's basically it. You don't need much more. But the divide seems to then continue in this direction here, in the direction of bandwidth. And while there's a level of saturation with regard to how many devices we can handle, uh, it is not clear if there's a level of saturation in this direction. How much bandwidth is enough? Uh, it seems to continue all the time. Only 10 years ago, we thought like, whoa, 256 kilobits, that's enough. Now we say now 10 mega, 100 mega, when is enough enough? When we have little holograms, how many megabit need we, do we need then? You know, it keeps on, keeps on going up in this direction. And we can also measure the digital divide with regard to the installed bandwidth capacity. And that gives us a quite different picture. For example, here, if we take again the year 2001 and we compare the number of kilobits 
that were available per person, per inhabitant. We see that in the year 2001, the average inhabitant of the, develop, of the developed world, of the industrialized countries, had on average about 50 kilobits, so 50 kilobits per person, and in developing countries, it was about 5 kilobits per person. So we have a divide of 10 to 1. Right. And then five years later, in 2006, first of all, the good news is that bandwidth increased incredibly in developing countries. It, it, it multiplied tenfold from five kilobits to 50 kilobits. So now in only five years, developing countries have caught up. They have also 50 kilobits. And this for sure opened uh, a world of possibilities for many for the first time. And it's, it's it's incredible advancement. However, what happened at the same time, the developing countries also continued. And actually, they increased even faster to 700 kilobits per person. So if we again calculate our divide, 700 divided by 50, it's a divide of 14 to 1. So now the divide increased. So while the digital divide in terms of the number of subscriptions of devices has decreased, everybody nowadays has a mobile phone, the digital divide in terms of bandwidth has actually increased during these five years. And that leads to this logic that actually if you study it over time, the divide in terms of kilobits uh, always increases and decreases. It increases and decreases with the introduction of different innovations. For example, here you have a divide of 11 to 1 in the year 2003. Then in the year 2007, you have a divide of 18 to 1 between high income and low income countries. And then in the year 2013, again, you have a divide of only 8 to 1. That depends on which kind of new innovation is right now diffusing through the social networks. Here, for example, the introduction of fiber optics has increased the divide because fiber optics was first introduced in the developed the rich countries. And then once it started to diffuse also to other countries, the divide has closed again. So the introduction of each new innovation increases or decreases the divide. And it's an incessantly ongoing process. And the driver of this opening and closing of the divide is actually technological progress. So there we have, again, this interplay between technological Technological progress, broadband always becomes broader, that's technological progress, and the diffusion of the innovation through society. So you get better, you diffuse, so you have better solution, you diffuse. So you have this, again, this alterating logic here. Um, economists refer to this effect as the red queen effect, the fact that the technological frontier is a moving target. The term comes from Alice in Wonderland, because when Alice went to Wonderland, she Met, met the Red Queen and she said, well, in our country, you generally get somewhere else if you run very fast for a long time, as we've been doing. What a slow sort of country, said the Queen. Now here you see it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast as that. Uh, obviously not possible, but, but the logic is basically that you kind of like you run on a running belt. And when you run on a running belt, standing still means falling behind. And if you want to catch up, you need to run faster than the running belt goes. So let's say both of them are moving, developed countries and developing countries, on this running belt. And if they both run at the same speed, they stand still. And if developing countries don't run as fast, well, actually, they fall behind. Even so, they're running, but they will still be falling behind. And that is the red queen effect. Standing still means falling behind. If you want to catch up, you have to run faster than the ones that are leading this process. So it's a, it's a relative metric that is moving as you measure. So we have two fundamental ways how we can look at the digital divide in terms of the number of subscriptions, and that's how it is usually done by most people. And we can see that actually worldwide, the number of subscriptions is very similar to the distribution of the people in the world, basically because we all have a mobile phone now, and we don't need much more than a mobile phone and maybe one fixed line device. And so if you compare these two graphs here, the number of ICT subscriptions and how they distribute among countries in the world and the population, 
and well, there are some differences, but but in general they look quite similar. Now, on the other hand, if you measure the digital divide in terms of the installed bandwidth potential of the telecommunication capacity in kilobits per second or in mega, megabits per second, you see a graph that looks quite different. This is not really following the global distribution of population. These graphs, just the first look shows you, they look different. However, this capacity graph shows is very similar to the global distribution of income. Also, not exactly the same, and but they look much more similar. So basically, what the conclusion here is that the number of subscription of telecom subscription follow population patterns. Everybody has a subscription now, so measuring also the number of subscriptions is kind of like an obsolete way of looking at it, because well, everybody has now access solution. Why do I, why should I want to measure that? Everybody has a mobile phone nowadays. However, the bandwidth capacity is actually an area of big concern because there we have a divide which seems to follow the income divide. And the global income divide, global and nationally income divides, are notoriously persistent, which also means that the digital divide, well, might be notoriously persistent. It means that well, it might be here to stay with us. We can now add this third income dimension to our previously outlined logic. So let's start again like we did before. We have here the number of subscriptions per capita, the number of ICT devices. And we see that here after 2 or 2.5 devices per capita, countries usually don't go up anymore. It's enough to have a fixed and a mobile phone solution. And then they kind of start going up here. They're going up to in the kilobits per capita direction. That's the bandwidth divide. And there are some countries with a lot of bandwidth, like Korea up here, and some countries with less bandwidth. Here you have Germany, here down you have Argentina, and you have a divide in, in this kind of direction. So what I did now is I added here a third dimension, which refers to uh, income per capita, cross-national income per capita. And you see here a very interesting logic along this axis. So, for example, what you see here is that there are some poor countries which do not have a lot of income per capita, so they're against this back wall here, and they still manage to migrate into this direction, into the direction of subscriptions per capita. That means they get a lot of mobile phones, basically cheap access solutions. But what they don't achieve to do is they do not achieve to go up. So you see, they kind of like they here add at the at the bottom still. They migrate in this direction, but they do not achieve going upwards. So you can play around with that then and you see that in order to have kilobits per capita in order to have bandwidth, you need to also have income and only then do you get this kind of logic. So you can look at it from different perspectives and what you find is well, basically this logic that it is it is surely possible to increase the number of subscription of ICT subscriptions even with little income, but if you need bandwidth, you need income, you need money. And what that says once again is that the kilobits divide, the bandwidth divide, follows the income divide, which is notoriously persistent and which also seems to suggest that the digital divide in terms of kilobits seems to have come here to stay with us. As income is highly concentrated worldwide, so is the potential to communicate in cyberspace. The top 10 most connected countries worldwide in general occupy 70-75% of the bandwidth potential. It means how much you can communicate. Uh, who these 10 countries are has changed over time as income realities have changed over time. For example, if you look here in 1986, it was still the typical industrialized countries who were among the ranks 1 to 8, so United States, Japan, France, Germany, UK, Italy, Russia, Canada. These are the typical G8 countries. And if you look at it 25 years later, uh, almost 30 years later, it has changed considerably. As income realities have changed, China has risen as a, a world power and is now occupying the majority of global bandwidth potential. 21% uh, has replaced the United States, which follows with 90%. And Japan, Korea, another country which had a very proactive 
ICT policy also is among the top ranks and India also joined the top 10 ranks in more recent times. But it's still the reality that the top 10 countries, even so they're now different, Asia plays a much bigger role in cyberspace nowadays, there's still 10 countries who dominate three out of four bits worldwide. The remaining 190 countries, well, they have to share one in four bits worldwide. So there is the digital divide is real, especially in terms of communication capacity. And while it is true that everybody has cell phones nowadays, um, kilobits, the bandwidth potential is highly concentrated and leads to a real informational inequality worldwide. And we don't really know the consequences that this might have. Information is certainly important for human development. Information is knowledge. Knowledge is power. So what is the consequence of such a high level of concentration?